Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for giving all up some of your time to come on and listen to me today. Um, I almost had to update my LinkedIn page slightly earlier on, pending the decision from government with regard to HS2 Houston Station, but luckily that's valid and it's all steam ahead on that one. Um, there have been some fascinating talks that we've heard so far, and it's very reassuring to see that I think we're all coming from very, very similar directions in terms of what we're aiming to accomplish here. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit around the human factor, and this is largely from my own perspective as an acoustic consultant and building designer, and particularly with regards to um, the experiential side and also the evidence basis on which we design the built environment. So as a starting point, the old world order, uh, it's, ex it, it, it's so ambiguous and it's so impenetrable for the people, the lay people who aren't technical, to understand exactly how we commonly refer to things. We talk about decibels, we talk about RWs, there are lots of little suffixes, there are lots of subscripts, there are little commas. What does it all mean? It means nothing to the man in the street, the person in the street. And that's, in, in terms of the human facts, we need to move away from this way of, of trying to articulate things. We, as a profession, have got to stop hiding behind extremely expensive technologies that we use to capture this information. It costs many thousands of pounds, you need a degree to use them, and they don't really benefit mankind per se. Because this just encourages us to behave in a very siloed fashion. We have a very narrow view on things, and for far too long now that's been the case. Things are changing, there is hope. Ultimately, we need to move away from this that the acoustic consultant, the professional practitioner on our job, is seen as some crazy scientist who's just trotting out all this very turgid information and just completely dumbfounding people. They don't understand it. So what we need to do is we're shifting now towards a more human-focused approach. And ultimately, we need to get a, a far broader view and a far deeper and richer understanding of what we want to get out of our buildings. And yes, Soundscapes and noise and vibration, they play a part in it, but as we've already seen from some of the earlier fascinating um, speakers and presentations that we've had, they're not the only part. There are so many other things that come into play. So, soundscaping. This isn't a new concept within acoustics, um, but it's a bit of a hotbed of activity at the moment. For many years, we've thought about soundscapes in terms of the, the external environment. But now what we're doing is we're actually taking some of those techniques, some of those thought processes, and we're actually applying them to the internal spaces. Because the long and the short of it is, uh, we, we can't just reduce down the discussion constantly to the idea of DBs, something being noisy, something being too quiet, too loud, or whatever. All of these different space types that we see up here, they have so many different requirements from the user's perspectives. And we can't just continue to discuss these things in such a, reduc a, a reduced fashion. And in order to do that, we, we need to start thinking about how do spaces make us feel? You know, what do they feel like? Uh, what sort of activities do they promote? What sort of activities do they discourage? And, and to do that, we need to start talking about the idea of the soundscape and a new language. I've mentioned already the idea of places being too noisy or places being too quiet. While you're sitting here at the moment, we can hear the, the rainfall on the roof occasionally when it's coming down. We can hear the, the fan, cooling fan on the projector. We can hear the, the air conditioning. All of these things are blending together. And so it's not just a single noise level, it's all of the sounds and how they're coming together and how they're making us think and how they're making us feel. Interestingly, when I was sitting down earlier on, and we, we have the music which is being played just before each of us presenters is coming on here. And it reminds me very much of sitting in a cinema and listening to the Pearl of Dean of old. Where ba -ba 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 so you in the audience, it's making you feel a certain way. It may be, intuitively, it probably makes you concentrate and focus a little bit more on what's going to be coming ahead. There may be a bit of excitement around it. From my perspective, as I walk up here, it might make me feel slightly apprehensive because I'm standing up here pretending that I'm the font of all knowledge around all of these things. But that's not the case. But ultimately, we move away from this idea of having a very simplistic, single-dimensional way of describing these things to a more multi-dimensional and much richer way of describing it, which is sort of what we're seeing here. But at the essence, we're moving the discussion away from talking about solely about an acoustic environment in terms of decibels. We're talking about soundscapes. And by that, soundscapes, we're talking about how, how the actual aural environment, the, the acoustic environment, how it makes us feel, what it enables us to do in life. In terms of the design, what's currently going on, 
in, with regard to um, the experiential design and in terms of the information, the evidence bases on which we're actually progressing these designs, I'll just touch on some of those elements now. So in terms of the experience, oralization, this isn't new. Oralization, it's been in existence probably for about 15 or 20 years now. We're just looking at a, a typical laboratory, if you like. Now, these are all based upon the idea of creating 3D ambisonic, ambisonic sounds. Stick my teeth back in on that one. So you sit in a globe of spheres, and what they do is they do some clever technology, and they play back all manner of sounds. It can be internal soundscapes, external soundscapes. And ultimately, you as a user, you will sit in yet another sweet spot, and you will listen to what's going on. And you can form some opinions about that. So these are fantastic tools because they allow very early stakeholder engagement. They allow users to experience spaces that the designer believes are right for them. But more importantly, it gives them the opportunity to actually respond back and say, no, actually, that's not what I'm after. Please don't build me that building. I want you to build me something different. The slight drawback with this is only a single sense that you're playing with. You're listening to the sounds. And because of that, much as we're doing now, we're concentrating quite hard. We're not necessarily paying attention to anything else which is happening in terms of our senses. Yes, we can have static images, which will give an idea of what it's going to look like, but ultimately, we're focusing too much. It's not as natural as we'd like to, you know, to see. So what we do is now is we look at the next generation of this. This is the immersive technologies, the immersive spaces. So rather than just engaging with stakeholders and users and designers and just listening to sounds and focusing on a static screen, what we're doing now is we have 3D animations, and so we have visualizations and renderings taking place. So it gives the opportunity to experience the sound and also experience the visuals at the same time. And these are collaborative spaces, so it allows larger bodies of people to get in there and have very detailed and very rich discussions in terms of this is what we want. They can see what it's going to look like. They can see the rich of the, you know, the textures, both hourly and also visually. Now, these technologies have been used you know, very, very widely. And fundamentally, from a designer's perspective, they're incredibly important. One of the main reasons behind that is they de-risk the situation. Because far too often in the past, we'll be designing to DBs and things like that. The users will come in, the occupiers will come in, and they'll be surprised at what they got. And they'll think, that's not what we thought. And the reason for that is, when you're writing the brief behind a project, what you're aiming to do, it can be quite difficult to actually get across that point. And so that's where these sort of technologies really are so powerful, because ultimately we go through that process so that there is no doubt whatsoever. It is very clear what has been agreed. That becomes the brief in itself, and then you can use some of that WISO fantastic technology and instrumentation to actually measure exactly what it is. You can record all the visualizations. So once you get to the end of the day, it's case, you know, that's, that's exactly what we agreed. Your perspectives may have changed on it between now and then, but that's, that's really where we were. The third generation of immersive technologies, it's, as you can see, it, it, it's not just a, you know, very feasibility studies, and th these are very, very developed concept designs. And so this is where we're going to really, truly into a multi-sensorial experience. And so it's no longer visual, it's no longer just the sound. Also, what we're going to be doing is you're going to be putting in um, controlled air, so you can start playing with the thermal comfort of spaces. You can look at the ambient lighting qualities. There's no reason why, in terms of that air quality, odors arguably could could be put in there as well. So this could be happening in the future. It's not there yet, but in years to come, this is where it's going to be going. So really, in terms of the experiential side of the design and what the professional bodies are moving towards now, we've seen. But then we start talking about the evidence behind it. So there's just some selections of what's taking place in terms of the research currently. In this particular scenario, we're talking about we have an oralization suite. But what we're doing is we're actually managed to harvest far more detailed information out of it. In this particular example we're looking at here, we have um, the subject, if you like, who, who I would point out straight away, he wasn't harmed in any of this. He doesn't rely upon any of that sort of stuff. He just has um, an, a, an encephalogram, which is placed on his head. And then what's being done is, with the transducers in the centers, we are then measuring the biophysiological response to the sounds that he's being experienced. And that's what we see in terms of this chart on the side. And then we're applying machine learning to that to start really getting under the skin of what do sounds make, you know, how do they feel to us? How do we respond to those as individuals? Biggish data. Earlier on when Poppy sort of showed the image of the apple, well, as you can see, I've got sort of similar ones up here. These are, they're so prevalent now. The great thing behind these is it gives 
access to this sort of information so that individuals, the people in the street, are self-educating about sound. They are listening to things, they're seeing some numbers on a screen, and it's encouraging them to just consider what's good for them and what's not good for them, which can't be a bad thing, of course, because we no longer have this discontinuity between the professionals and the design team and the users. They're starting to understand a little bit more what we're talking about, and they're more informed and arguably more, imp more opinionated, which is a good thing. The really expensive instrumentation that I mentioned earlier on in terms of the practitioner spending many tens of thousands of pounds, we're now in a luxurious position where that price point has come right down. So we have the micro-electromechanical systems availability now. It means in terms of those, the little transducers, the devices that measure those sound levels in the first place, instead of being tens of thousands of pounds and you need a degree in order to operate them, they're now hundreds of pounds instead. So this means the amount of availability we have of the data which underpins all of the research that's taking place in terms of the health impacts and the quality of life around sound, that's all coming on stream. And then finally, the quality of life evaluation, otherwise known as post-occupancy evaluations. This is, where, this is the real litmus test. So ultimately, once users have gone into the buildings, whether or not it's their homes, whether or not it's their office spaces, it's actually carrying out those studies to get that subjective feedback from them in terms of, do they actually like the spaces that they're inhabiting? Now currently, there's thoughts with regard to embedding the transducers and sensors within these buildings. So we can start doing that in a real-time basis. We have the availability of Fitbits. Again, it's another tool that the people in the street, they can tap into this, so it means they're far more considerate with regard to are they getting what they want out of their buildings? And that, all that information feeds back to us as designers, and it's creating that virtuous cycle in effect. So it's no longer a case of, yes, we met all the criteria. All of that information is gonna be pumped back in so that we are making better and better buildings all the time. And ultimately, this is all about focusing completely on the humans the occupants. We need to move away from decibels, we need to move away from these oversimplistic discussions in terms of certain reductions between spaces, certain quantities. That's interesting for the designers, but it's not really interesting for the users. The users are interested in having places which are appropriate for the activities and the lives that they want to lead. Thank you very much.